recording. Let's all stand and be singing number two. Bye. 
Thank you, Marissa, and all the volunteers who help with VBS. We have, uh, we have these little things in your pews. They're called attendance rosters or registers, or they just say welcome. Please fill those out each week, and then kindly take it, the page you just filled out, put it on top of your book, and lay it on the end of your pew. Sounds complicated, but it makes it a lot easier for when they try to go around and pick them up, so they don't have to open each book and see if there's anything in it. We have a brand new sacristy refrigerator. Anybody who's been done communion prep, you know we had some real issues. All fixed. Everybody, yay. We have a board meeting following second service. Everybody, I'm sorry? I, no. I think so. That's what was in the law, was regular board. Tell me if I'm wrong, Jen. <clears throat> Um, I have executive council. I don't know the board, but I'm executive council. Let's do that. Debbie, do you want to announce about DJF next month, or do you want me to? I'll let you. Okay, you next month, <laughs> Disciple Women's Fellowship is hosting the executive director of Fostering Connections, and we are really happy to have her come. We have some experience in this church with foster children. And we know that the need is real to help along those parents with things that those kids might not show up with. So everyone in the church is welcome to come on the 20th of July. That's a Thursday. Watch for more information in the log. I mean every month, one. guys, gals, kids, whoever is interested, please come and hear more from Lacey about how you can help the foster community in this in this town. Um, anything, any other announcements that I'm, which I'm unaware of? Oh, we need to continue with Elaine in your prayers. She had another scan and there might be something going on, but we're going to pray that it was an illusion and her next scan, everything is going to be perfect. So, any other prayer concerns? Everybody's happy. All right, I like that. So, our biggest joy today then is having a whole row of people sitting there who are related to our guest pastor. And we, we're real welcoming you back, Kent Dorsey. He's been with us before, <laughs> and we are we're very blessed that he's willing to join us one more time. Kent? Thank you, Marsha. Mike, am I on here? Yes, I'm on here. So I bring you greetings from my hometown, Gerard, my home church, First Christian Church of Gerard, which is now my retirement congregation. Usually I'm sitting in the pews. Uh, a little over a year ago, in March, I think it was, I filled in for Dustin when he was off doing a wedding or something like that, and I do hope that this is not Dustin's first break from the pulpit <laughs> in that span of time. I have served seven congregations as a minister, and it is normal and it is good to ask the minister, have you set that meeting? Have you made that pastoral visit? Have you visited last Sunday's Visitors in worship, those are all good questions. Less often do you hear the question, are you getting time for renewal? How can we help you take a real vacation? How can we support you for a sabbatical? So it is good to be with you today and may we all pray that Dustin is taking a deep breath. I say this because I believe that discipleship is a dance. Following Christ is the dance of the Spirit. I'll explain in the sermon how I think we need to resist those who think that Christianity is a forced march. Because I believe following Christ is the dance of the Spirit 
All followers of Christ are dancers. Yes, the pastors are dance instructors. But they're no different from the dancers. We must all catch our breath to keep on dancing. It is good to be with you this morning. And I understand there's a moment in here in which I uh, encourage you to greet each other. And then there'll be some music that reminds us all to come back to our seats. If I didn't do that correctly, forgive me. <laughs> but say hello to each other. Good morning. Let's continue that spirit of prayer as we bow our heads and ask for God's grace. God of mercy, we come to you in thanksgiving this morning for the rains that have freshened this good earth. As often as we decry cloudy days and rain that spoils our picnics, we have been mindful for the past months of the absence of rain what a terrible effect it has on all your creation, our spirits are renewed by the clouds, by the dews, by the rains, by the thriving of life that is around us. You have made it all, and after six days you took a day of rest and you have beckoned us, not just to honor that Sabbath day, but to recognize that there may be days of labor and only hours of 
leisure, that like the rain that comes in the midst of the drought, we come to you in prayer with the hope that you will renew our spirits, that you will freshen us, that you will give us the breath of life, that you will embolden our feet as we dance along with you. We lift up in prayer those today for whom sun and rain don't make enough difference because they are ill, because they are lonely, because they have been shut off by illness or some other factors in life that have made them remain away from others. We lift up those who never get a Sabbath, who have to work and work and work and still see that the ends don't meet. We pray for those who wait for the waters of justice to roll down like a mighty stream and continue to look at a dry stream bed. We pray for rain. We pray for hope. We pray for those who are merciful, not just who have benefited from mercy, but who have extended it to others. We ask that you would renew our spirits in these songs, in these words, in this breaking of bread, together with Christ, to freshen us for the dance you have laid out for us, for the walk toward your mercy. Be with us in worship. Go with us into the world. We ask and hope all of these things in the name of the one who also taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
see the band-aid, anything like that? Okay, well, here's my secrets, ready? If you got a cut, you know what you do? Put a sticker on it. Yep. Think that'll work? If you got a splinter, put some peanut butter on it. Yep. Think that's gonna work? Yeah. No? Why not? Um, if, if you get a burn, you know what you should do? Have a butterfly land on it. Think it's gonna work? No. Oh. You don't think so? Alright, here's my last one. Uh, if you stub your toe, duct tape. They say duct tape fixes everything. Think it's gonna work? No. No. I bet nothing. None of those things are gonna work? You say you know, I did not become a doctor in the past two hours, I can stick to teaching. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're gonna let grandma stick to that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> She's gonna come up with some better options than duct tape. Alright, so you're probably thinking those are not real solutions, and you are, um, you know, probably right. Those were not uh, the answers you expected to hear, were they? What would you expect to hear if you got a cut? A band -aid. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, but sometimes we get unexpected answers to our problems or questions. And sometimes we might get unexpected answers to prayers, right? When you pray, do you always get the exact thing that you pray for? No. God answers our prayers, but sometimes it's not in the way that we expect. Um, and sometimes things may work out in a totally different way that we were not expecting at all. And guess what? Do you think that happened in the Bible too? No. Yes, it happened in the Bible too. They, um, do you think Jesus did exactly what the people expected all the time? <laughs> Definitely not. Um, before Jesus came, they might have thought he was going to be this big, mighty, powerful king. And then Jesus came along, and Jesus was super humble. And he was a servant, wasn't he? Do you think that's what the people expected? No. Probably not. Um, now, in the Bible story today, that they're going to read here in a little bit. Um, there's a little girl who got sick. And um, by the time Jesus went to her, they said that she was already dead. But you know what Jesus said? <laughs> yeah, Magnolia heard this in the first service. Thanks, Magnolia. <laughs> she was just laughing. So by the time Jesus got there, um, he said, you know, She's actually just sleeping. Come on, wake up. And she got up, and she was alive. Do you think that's what people expected? No. no. Definitely not. Um, and you know what else Jesus said? What? He said, you know, the healthy people don't need a doctor. The sick people do. I didn't come for the people who were already good enough. I came to save the lost and to heal the hurting and the sick. Are we all sometimes hurting and sick, though? Yeah. So Jesus came for all of us. We all need Jesus all the time, don't we? We definitely need Jesus more than my silly answers, right? With duct tape and stickers and peanut butter and butterflies. I think Jesus is going to do a lot more for us. Yeah, I think so, too. Are you ready to pray? Can you repeat after me? Dear God, Dear God. thank you for loving us and sending us Jesus. We love you. Amen. All right, let's go to Children's Church.
gives the instruction to go seek mercy, do not seek sacrifice. We come to this table of sacrifice which the merciful one himself gave life. Gave life. Mercy always extends life. We come to this table to ourselves learn about mercy and to be guided in the paths of mercy for ourselves, for the sake of the world around us. Let us prepare our hearts to receive this most merciful gift. That evening in the upper room, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. In a like manner, he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to all of them, saying, Take, drink, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, you have promised many blessings to those who wait for you, new strength, resurgence of hope, Awareness of your continual presence, waiting for you, enables us to glorify you by living in deep dependence on you, ready to do your will. Living close to you makes our lives less complicated and cluttered. Thank you, Jesus, for your death on the cross for our sins and your resurrection to heaven where you are our advocate with the Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us eat of the bread of life. Let us drink of the cup of salvation.
reading today is Matthew 9, 9 to 13, and also Matthew 9, 18 to 26. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, Go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. Here ends the lesson. Jim Harris, I think we all applauded, not just because of the performance, but our hands were saying thank you for uh, letting that flute pray for us. Thank you. And any time we have a chance to come forward and taste God's mercy, we don't expect to sit down on the floor. <laughs> But you went ahead and tasted of God's mercy. That's the more important thing. And I'm glad you're okay. The gospel reading for this second Sunday after the day of Pentecost from the ninth chapter of Matthew that you have just heard always gets me to thinking of that delightful little song Lord of the Dance. Chances are you have sung it at church camp, maybe at an Easter sunrise service. I danced in the morning when the world was begun. But the part that always makes me think of the song is, well, there weren't scribes and Pharisees in the reading. There were just Pharisees. But there's that verse in the song, I danced for the scribes and the Pharisees. But they would not dance, no, they wouldn't follow me. I danced for the fishermen, for James and John. I don't know why Matthew wasn't in there. <laughs> they came with me, and the dance went on. Dance then, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. I'm a Gerard boy, married a Gerard girl that's still with me. In high school, I was the drum major of the Gerard High School marching band in my senior year. And I am still impressed when I see a group of organized musicians who can crisply put the left foot on the downbeat and follow through with the right foot. And you can look down the rows, or you can look that way across the lines. And everything is straight, and 
and everything is in tandem. I really don't like it when I see a band take a simple right or left 90 degree turn and it ends up, I don't know, looking like a flock of sheep run <laughs> astray. Marching, playing a John Philip Sousa composition and staying crisply in step with 60 or 80 other musicians. That is a beautiful thing. The Pharisees liked to follow the law of Moses in spiritual march step. They devoted their lives to, to studying the law and interpreting the law for others so that they too could remain faithful to the law in step. The Pharisees were so devoted to keeping everyone in line that faith in God became the forced march toward righteousness. Jesus disrupted this parade. The parade was making everybody sick. His walk of faith was the dance of the Spirit. We're certain that the Pharisees are always the bad guys in the story of Jesus. So we miss the important point that the Pharisees sang out of the same hymnal as Jesus. Jesus did not dismiss the Pharisees as evil. Opponents, yes. Enemies, no. The Pharisees, the scribes, the priests, the followers of Jesus, well, and Jesus himself, all honored God and were eager to help others live a life that honors God and helps human beings to flourish. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? We're reading from the Gospel of Matthew, likely named after the tax collector named Matthew, the very one in our story today that Jesus invited, follow me, and he did. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Tax collectors, they're a special hot mess. The tax collectors were Jewish, descendants of King David, the prophet Moses and Father Abraham, just like Jesus and just like the Pharisees who asked the question. The Jesus story was written at a time in history when the Roman Empire was killing it. With, a, with their unequaled power, Rome dominated the lands of what had been the kingdom of Israel. Costs money. To pay for the occupying military and political machinery of Rome, Jewish tax collectors bought the license to collect taxes for the Roman Empire from their own Jewish people. Now, we would call that a puppet government. We would call that taxation without representation. So we get it. 
And to make messy matters worse, the tax collectors were allowed to gouge their Jewish neighbors and to keep all of that ill-gotten wealth so long as they made the scheduled payments to Rome. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? This was not a rhetorical question designed to make Jesus look bad. It was a heartfelt question arising from the multiple humiliations laid upon every Jew by the Roman Empire. So Jesus evidently didn't know what we know, that, wow, they're the enemies. They're always the bad guys. You can never trust a scribe or a Pharisee. We all know that. Well, did you notice here that Jesus does not chase the Pharisees away, doesn't turn off their microphone, doesn't tell his security detail to escort them from the premises. Jesus heard the humiliation in their question. And he answered their question clearly with no hesitation. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick need a doctor. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. I am here to heal. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Seek mercy instead of keeping track of penalties, payments. This answer tells us who Jesus is. This answer tells us who the Pharisees are. His answer also tells us followers of Jesus who we are. I'm here to heal. God dances toward us mercifully. God's mercy dances in and heals what ails us. And instead of elaborating the point, Matthew goes on to tell a story of mercy that is itself interrupted by yet another story of mercy. A Jewish leader, leader comes and kneels before Jesus to plead for the life of his little daughter who is just now on the other side of death's door. Jesus and his disciples make haste to get to the little girl. And on the way, a woman with a menstrual ailment touches the fringe of Jesus' coat. This womanly ailment, you got to love the euphemisms of the New Testament. This womanly ailment made her unclean. That's Pharisee speak for stay away. Do not touch. It's a theological virus to be unclean, and it is easily transmissible to others. Touch could even force a man into a period of isolation and spiritual cleansing if an unclean woman touches a man. Just touching Jesus on the fringe of his coat could jeopardize him? You know it's going to earn her terrible penalty. Responding to her touch on the fringe of his coat, Jesus stepped way out of line and said, Take heart, daughter. Daughter? 
Pharisees and the tradition of the law cries, technical foul, Jesus, you are out of the band. Pack up your sousaphone and get out of here and take that woman with you. Did you see that? Did you hear that? He called, after she touched him, he called her daughter. As in, daughter of Israel, daughter of David, daughter of Moses, daughter of Abraham. Jesus said, Pay no attention to that drum major, daughter. You are still in the band. It's okay. Faith heals. Keep dancing. God is here. And you are whole. Daughter. <laughs> oh, talk about throwing red meat to the Pharisees. But it wasn't just a rhetorical thing. No. Jesus, the I came to heal, that Jesus was knitting this ostracized woman back <coughs> into the fabric of faith. He didn't give her the faith. He acknowledged that this daughter is faithful and whole and complete and beautiful. In the end, loyalty to the law can only take life. Only mercy can give life. The powers that be, doing the best that we can with the best of intentions, can only take life. Faith, hope, healing, Mercy, they give life. So I'm not troubled by the Pharisees who stalked Jesus. He was pretty capable of taking them on. I am troubled by religious people today who want to send me and they want to send you and they want to send everyone else on the forced march of fear, intolerance, bullying, and violence, threatened violence, and real violence. Not the people from some other religion or no religion at all. They are us. Singing out the same hymnal, quoting the same Bible, preaching and marching on social media like the Pharisees who dogged Jesus. They powerfully claim that tradition is on their side and they are certain they are just rock solid certain that Jesus has called them to a lockstep Christianity on the march. I have a little sympathy for them. They are just like me because I find it much easier to march than to dance. When you're marching, I mean, there's a little bit of a challenge to it, but when you're marching, you must only keep step with the people around you to look good. When you dance, at least if you dance like me, you find it much easier to make the mistakes that make you look bad. When Jesus finally arrived at the home of the little girl, he announced to the crowd of mourners, she's not dead. She is sleeping. And they laughed. Mm. Maybe Jesus the dancer tripped. Jesus went on into the home, took the little girl by the hand, and she got up. 
Sacrifice takes life. Mercy gives life. Turns out that the laugh of the crowd was correct. It was just at the wrong time. Mercy gives life. Mercy laughs at death. The little girl was up and the heavens laughed with delight. The Spirit of God was dancing. Well, this is not really about marching bands versus ballet. This is about following Jesus and doing everything we can at any place that is possible to be closer to God and healing all of the sicknesses, including Christianity, that surround us here and now and infect our own hearts. All we have to do is remember that sacrifice always seeks a victim. Mercy always seeks a dancing partner. The Christian Church Disciples of Christ call ourselves a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. Sounds like mercy. Dance then wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I'll lead you all wherever you may be, and I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Amen. find our hymn of invitation on the screen, first and fourth verses of Have Thine Own Way. If there's anyone here desiring a closer walk with God by becoming a part of this community of wholeness making in the middle of a kind of fragmented world, I invite you to come and be a part of this community. <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ, sons and daughters of God, we go into a world, we know it's a mess, and we know that we're a mess when we show up, but we can remember the instruction of Jesus, go and find out, he says, find out what this means. I seek mercy, not sacrifice. Go in the peace and the mercy of the one who was raised from death itself and laughs and dances. Amen.